Friends, before you start reading this story, do me one small favor, turn on notifications for this channel, and get ready to leave a comment at the end. Because what you are about to read is not just dry fact from the past. This is a detective story 80 years long. A story about a ghost that still roams the battlefields all over the world, from Afghanistan to the streets of modern megacities. And this ghost was born in the death throes of a single state. Are you ready to find out how the corpse of one empire gave birth to the weapon of the future? Then let's go. And don't miss the end. The main revelation awaits you there. April Ghosts. April, the year 2045. Picture this. Not blooming gardens and not the first spring warmth. Imagine the Mauser factory in the town of Oberndorf am Neckar. Once it was the heart of German firearms engineering, a forge that hammered out victories for the Kaiser and the ambitions of the Fuhrer. Now it is a pile of twisted metal, broken glass, and ghosts. The roof is shattered by Allied bombs. Through holes in the ceilings, you can see the smoke-filled, crimson sky glowing with fires. The air is thick. It smells of soot, burnt insulation, metal dust, and fear. The Americans will be here soon. Everyone knows this. The war is lost. The Reich, which was supposed to last a thousand years, is living out its last days, its final hours. And in this hell, in this kingdom of doom, a group of engineers in grease-stained lab coats, with a feverish gleam in their eyes, is doing something utterly devoid of common sense. They are not evacuating. They are not trying to save themselves. They are urgently, with insane speed, assembling a few dozen strange-looking assault rifles from surviving parts. This is not the STG-44, the already legendary Sturmgewehr. This is something else. More angular, simpler in appearance, but no less mysterious. They call their creation the STG-45M, the 45-year model for Mauser. This is their last child, born in the death throes of the Third Reich. They believe, no, they know, that this is not just a weapon. This is the quintessence of all their experience, all their genius, cast in metal. This is a message to the future. A bottle thrown into the stormy sea of history with a message inside. And they are right. This bottle will be found, and the message will be read. And it will forever change the face of war. Why is this story so important for us today? Why should we care about some old German rifle? Here's why. You have undoubtedly seen this weapon in dozens, if not hundreds, of movies and news reports. You just didn't know that its soul was born in that very destroyed workshop in April 45. Ready to recognize its face? Then let's continue. Chapter 1. The Economy of Despair Why does genius need a catastrophe? To understand the phenomenon of the STG-45, M, you can't just look at the blueprints. You need to understand the world in which it appeared. And that world was collapsing, quickly and irreversibly. Let's step away from metal and gunpowder and look at the numbers. Or rather, as you requested, at the words. Imagine Germany in the year 1944. After the Allied landings in Normandy and the monstrous losses on the Eastern Front, it became clear a war on two fronts is a death sentence. The economy of the Reich, working to the point of exhaustion, began to crack at the seams. Economic background, my thoughts and analysis. I delved into the economic reports of those years, and a terrifying picture emerges. German industry was phenomenally efficient, but its resources were limited. The key industrial areas of the Ruhr were being systematically destroyed by bombing. The delivery of raw materials from the occupied territories was becoming more and more difficult. Labor costs. The predecessor of our hero, the STG-44 rifle, was revolutionary but expensive. Its production required many hours of skilled labor from millers and machine operators. Its approximate cost was about 70 Reichsmarks. Is that a lot or a little? For comparison, Producing the good old Mauser in 98K rifle cost about 55 Reichsmarks. 
It would seem the difference is small. But under the conditions of total war, when you need to arm millions of soldiers, every penny, every minute of working time counts. Multiply that difference by hundreds of thousands of units and you get an astronomical figure. Materials. The STG-44 required quality steel blanks. And metal was needed for tanks, for planes, for submarines. The Germans started saving on everything. Wooden stocks were made rougher. The design of the bayonet was simplified. But it wasn't enough. Crisis and the Volkssturmgewehr. The apotheosis of despair was the Volkssturm program, a total militia, where old men and boys were conscripted. They needed simple and cheap weapons. This is how primitive rifles like the VG-1-5 to appeared, which were essentially a piece of pipe with a spring and a barrel. Crude, ugly, lethal. While some factories were stamping this disposable weapon for militiamen, the engineers of Mauser were thinking differently. They understood. You couldn't win the war with quantity anymore. So a new level of quality was needed. Not elite, but technological. The paradox. To save the situation, it was necessary not to simplify, but to complicate. But to complicate with intelligence. And here we come to the crux of the matter. The task for designers Wilhelm Stahel and Ludwig Vorgrimler was formulated cruelly and simply. Create a weapon that is not inferior to the STG-44 in effectiveness, but costs at least 30% less. The goal, 45 Reichsmarks. Imagine the pressure. You are required to perform a miracle under conditions where there are no materials, no time, no confidence in tomorrow. And they perform this miracle. How? By betting not on brute force, but on intellect. On a brilliant engineering idea. Chapter 2. The Magic of Rollers. The Heart of the Ghost. So what was the secret? Why was the STG-45M so special? It all comes down to one node, the bolt locking system. The heart of any automatic weapon. The STG-44 used a system of diverting propellant gases from the barrel. A classic, reliable, but requiring precise machining of the gas piston, tube, and locking assembly. Expensive and labor-intensive. The Germans turned their gaze to another of their brilliant creations, the MG-42 machine gun. The buzzsaw of the Wehrmacht. And at its core lay a roller lock bolt. The idea was not new, but the Germans perfected it. And so Stahel and Vordermler thought, what if we adapt this principle for a rifle, but not just copy it, but develop it? Thus, the roller delayed blowback system was born. Let me explain this magic in simple terms as an ordinary person because it's brilliantly simple. Imagine you have a door that a tremendously powerful stream is trying to push open these are the propellant gases. If you just open it, you'll be swept away. If you put a huge doorstop in its path, as in gas-operated systems, it's reliable but bulky. The Germans did something else. They put the door on a clever lock. Inside the door frame, there are two small but very strong steel rollers. When the door is closed, these rollers come out of the grooves in the frame and rest against special slopes on the door itself. They're like wedges that prevent the door from moving backward. When you pull the trigger, a shot is fired. The enormous pressure of the propellant gases pushes the cartridge case backward, and the case, in turn, pushes against the bolt, our door. But it can't move instantly. It first needs to push these very rollers inside the bolt to remove these wedges. This takes fractions of a millisecond. But this time is enough for the bullet to fly out of the barrel and for the pressure in the barrel to drop to a safe level. And only then, when the main work is already done, does the bolt calmly and safely recoil backward to eject the spent cartridge case and chamber a new round. This was a gamble. It was an all-in move. The slightest inaccuracy in the slope angle, in the roller diameter, and the whole system would go to hell. The cartridge case could rupture. The weapon could simply explode in the shooter's hands. But it worked. It worked brilliantly. And here the engineers went even further. They encountered a problem. After firing, 
The cartridge case stuck so strongly to the walls of the chamber that it was difficult to extract. And they found an elegant solution. They made longitudinal grooves, flutes, in the chamber. These grooves allowed a small part of the propellant gases to seep backward and slightly lift the case, peeling it off the walls like an air cushion. This little trick, the fluted chamber, would later become the hallmark of all Heckler Coke rifles. Imagine this contrast. On one hand, a Folkster militiaman with a crude iron pipe, firing once a minute. On the other, an engineer in a destroyed workshop, calculating micron tolerances for steel rollers that would define the face of weapons for the next 80 years. Two sides of one dying empire. Chapter 3. The fire tests that never happened. What would the tests have shown? The prototypes were assembled. 10, 20, maybe 30 pieces. The exact number we will probably never know. They were different. Some with the familiar 30-round magazines from the STG-44. Some with small, 10-round ones, probably to facilitate testing. And what about the tests? This is where the main drama lies. The war ended before the STG-45, M, could be truly fired, tested in real combat, and have all its teething problems identified. It remained a ghost, a shadow, an unrealized potential. But we can speculate. Based on later tests of its direct descendants, the SETME, and HKG3 rifles, we can say the following. Reliability. The roller delay blowback system turned out to be phenomenally durable and undemanding regarding lubrication. It worked well under dusty conditions, which is critically important for infantry weapons. Accuracy. The inline configuration, where the stock is in line with the barrel, meant less barrel jump when fired. This provided higher accuracy in burst fire, especially compared to the AK-47. The shooter could control the weapon better. Ergonomics. The weapon turned out to be quite light and well-balanced. The stamped receiver made it technologically advanced, and the high sight line made it convenient for rapid fire. What would have happened if the Germans had refined this rifle and started its mass production at least six months earlier? Would it have changed the course of the war? Hardly. No small arms, no matter how advanced, could compensate for the overwhelming superiority of the Allies in manpower, equipment, and air power. But it would undoubtedly have increased the losses of our grandfathers and great-grandfathers. And that's a terrible thought. Chapter 4. The Phoenix's Path. How the ghost of the STG-45, M, rose from the ashes. The most amazing part of this story begins when the story, it would seem, has ended. The Reich fell. The factories lay in ruins. The engineers, including chief designer Ludwig Vorgrimler, were arrested, interrogated, and turned out to be unnecessary. Their genius was a war trophy. And here a real spy thriller begins. The Americans, having studied the captured samples and their reports from the Aberdeen Proving Ground, dryly noted the extensive use of stamp parts and experiments with fluted chambers. They did not see a revolution in the STG 45 M. For them, it was just another curious German Wonderwaff, the dead end branch. They bet on their own. Eugene Stoner's gas-operated system, which would later become the M16. And what about the French? They were more cunning. They hired Vorgrimler and his team to work on their secret weapons program, CM. Germans, who yesterday worked for Hitler, were today working for France, tried to adapt their design to American cartridges. The irony of fate. But here, too, the project stalled. And then Spain enters the scene. Yes. Yes, Franco is Spain, a country untouched by the World War, but desperately in need of modern weapons for its army. They created the Setme Company and invited Ludwig Vorgrimler to join them. And here, under the hot Spanish sun, the ghost of the STG 45 M finally found flesh and blood. Vorgrimler perfected his system. He created the Setme Modelo, a rifle and then the Modelo B. This was no longer a raw prototype, but a full-fledged, reliable combat weapon. 
in West Germany, creating its new Bundeswehr in the 50s, urgently needed a new rifle. They looked at American options at the Belgian FNFAL, but their gaze fell on the creation of their own former compatriots, refined in Spain. The Germans refined the Setme. In the year 1959, a legend was born the Heckler Koch G3 rifle. The G3 became the main infantry weapon of the Bundeswehr in more than 70 other countries around the world. Its recognizable profile, characteristic dry bolt clatter, and supreme reliability became the standard. The ghost of the STG 45M did not just revive it conquer the world. But that's not the end either. The company Heckler Koch, taking the brilliant roller delayed blowback system as a basis, created an entire weapons empire on its foundation. The MP5 submachine gun, a legend of special forces. It could be seen in the hands of the British SAS, the German GSG-9, the American FBI. Its accuracy and reliability made it the gold standard for counterterrorism operations. Remember the assault on the plane in Mogadishu? All those movies about special forces? That's it. The MP5 is the direct grandson of that very prototype from Oberndorf. The 33 Hong Kong dollars rifle. A scaled-down version of the G3 for an intermediate cartridge, a competitor to the AK-74 and M16. The 21 Hong Kong dollars general-purpose machine gun a powerful and reliable support weapon. It turns out that a single engineering idea, born in a desperate attempt to save 45 Reichsmarks, gave birth to an entire family of weapons that defined and continues to define the appearance of conflicts in the second half of the 20th and early 21st centuries. A dialogue with the shadow, the legacy we don't notice. Today, in the 21st century, when new systems are replacing the old ones, it seems that the story of the STG-45M is just an interesting fact for historians and weapons enthusiasts. But I believe that's not the case. This story is a powerful metaphor. It is a story about how an idea turns out to be stronger than an empire. How a creation outlives its creator. The Third Reich, with its misanthropic ideology and imperial ambitions, crumbled to dust and is condemned by all humanity. But the modest engineering development of its scientists is alive. It serves, alas, both terrorists and peacekeepers and the armies of democratic states. It is neutral, it is just a tool. And in this lies its terrible and great power. The STG 45M became a bridge, a bridge between the era of classic rifles with wooden stocks and the era of modern high-tech small arms. It proved that the future lies in technological efficiency, in intelligent design, not in brute force and gigantomania. The next time you see a news report about special forces with MP5S, or see an old movie with a Bundeswehr soldier holding AG3, remember this story. Remember the destroyed workshop, the engineers with a feverish gleam in their eyes, and a few dozen angular prototypes that never made it to the war, but managed to change the world. They assembled not just a rifle. They assembled a ghost that defined the future. That's all, friends. This story is over. But the dialogue with history is not. What do you think? Was it a brilliant engineering thought, or just another dead-end project of the Third Reich that just got lucky? Maybe you served with the G3 or MP5 and can share your experience. Your opinion is priceless. Write your detailed comment below. Let's argue and discuss. And of course, if you've scrolled to this point, you are a true connoisseur of deep stories. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell because we have many more such detective investigations from the world of history and technology ahead. You will find stories about the Soviet Kalashnikov and the American M16, and we will definitely compare them with the legacy of our today's hero, the ghost from Oberndorf. See you soon.